Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Daniel. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Daniel. I've been coming to this meeting for a few years now, and uh, I guess eventually I was going to have to speak at it. <laughs> so here I go. Um... I don't know. I've, I've been feeling kind of, uh, I'm coming up on two years and it's taken me since I'm 40 years old. I went to my first meeting when I was 23. So do the math, right? It's been 17 years to take me to get two years sober. And, um, you know, during those 17 years, you know, I tried every which way tonight, and I did not want to come here. Like, bottom line is, I didn't want to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't want to go to Narcotics Anonymous. I don't want to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't want to be sober. I wanted, I, I, I tried every way imaginable to not end up in these rooms, and here I am. Um, you know, I think this is like a, it's, I think this is a family disease. My grandfather died of this disease. My mother's grandfather died of this disease. Um, somehow I skipped her, and I and, and somehow I, I end up in these rooms. And and what? Long story short, what happened was, um, I mean, I was never born with any kind of like off switch or break or, you know, I hit I hit the road running when I started drinking and using. And I, you know, I grew up like I grew up in the city, and so it was just easy to get. Easy to get drugs at a young age, and then when I turned 21, started my daily uh, drinking habit, like, right away, and, um, you know, I love drinking, really. Like, I love, ha- I'm like a bar fly, I love doing things like camping, or festivals, or concerts, anything that gives me a license to fucking drink as much as I possibly can, I, I like doing I like doing, and, um, and you know what, I, I do some of those things today, and I, you know, obviously I do them sober, and I actually enjoy it, like, way more, like, going dancing sober, and I enjoy it way more, uh, going camping sober, um, but it's been, it's been really hard, I guess, the last couple weeks, you know, there's, like, an ebb and flow to life, and I feel like I'm in the ebb right now, and, I've been like super depressed and my mood's been all over the place. At some moments during the day, I feel like this like empty shell and I'm just like completely hopeless and lost. And, um, other parts of the day, I have like this incredible sense of compassion and connection to humanity. And, um, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of it's kind of like using a little bit, just sitting here trying to feel my feelings. I am just fucking all over the place. Um, so what happened was I ended up um, going to long term treatment like four years ago. I guess in, yeah, four years ago I went to long term treatment, and I'm one of those alcoholics that got to a point where like I couldn't just um, you know, be in my apartment and, like, go to a meeting and then go home and, like, expect to, like, not drink the next day. Yeah, I just, I had to get fucking locked up. And I got locked up for six months, six whole months. And, uh, you know what? I look back on it, it was actually a gift for me. It was a gift to be able to, like, shut it all down and go somewhere safe and go to groups and get, like, a buffer before, before I got re- released, um, back onto the streets, I guess, um, you know, and I did, I started working the steps again, I have a sponsor who's got a sponsor, and I started working the steps again, I did a really thorough four-step, and I started writing my eight-step amends, and then I relaxed again, and that was, um, that was in May of 2016, and I went back to that treatment center, and I kind of did it all over again, and, um, I got out and I got a new sponsor and where I left off was those, uh, was that ACE step list. 
And I told him, I was like, dude, I gotta, there's some amends, like, I gotta make. There's some shit that's, like, really, like, on my back right now. And I told him, like, you know, I did a thorough four step the last time. He's like, fuck it, let's do these amends. And, um, to me, I think you hear, like, a psychic change or a spiritual awakening. Um, for me, it was, it was after I started going back to those people and taking responsibility for my behavior and um, taking accountability and doing whatever I needed to do. There was a couple of people that didn't know, like, I ripped them off. Like, they had no idea. I thought they knew, but they had no idea I ripped them off. And there was a couple other people who, like, I owed amends who just didn't answer my um, – didn't answer me when I reached out. Uh, but I ended up doing them thank you. I ended up doing amends to, like, my child and his mom and my mother and, like, a lot of, like, really big amends. And um, – I don't know if this is a reason, but like I think this is like I think that's a big reason why I was able to stay this time because there was just like this shift in me. There was this like internal shift in me where um I found like this another another level of freedom and uh not only did I find another level of freedom, I also found out that like doing these amends is like really fucking hard. It's like really hard to go back and and to make amends and with that it's like i don't want to i don't want to behave like that anymore i don't want to have to like go back sober and be like hey you know what i took advantage of you and you know i was a shitty person and you know i'm sorry what can i do to make it right you know i don't i don't want to behave like that and hopefully hopefully um i I won't have to but i'm definitely really cognizant of it um so I, I did the steps, and I turned around, and I did the steps again, and now working the traditions with a sponsor. And, um, you know, life's really good, and, my, you know, relax and drugs and making mistakes and trying to figure out a way to drink successfully is, like, all a part of my story. And um, and for some reason, I'm, I'm up here, and I, and, um, I get to recover today, and I realize, like, it's actually, like, a really... I don't want to say special. It sounds so fucking corny, but it is. It's like it's a, it's like it's a, it's a, it's a good thing because there's a lot of people out there dying from this disease, and we all made it to a meeting. So thanks. My name is Kelly. I am an alcoholic. Hi, Kelly. And this is such a trip um, because. I remember, like, when I first got sober and I started coming to this meeting, and I was like, okay, so, like, the person who speaks the longest, like, clearly has to be extremely sober. Like, there's no way that, like, they would just let anyone up there, right? (laughs) And I'm up here. Um, So, I don't know what that means, but... um, But, like, I got asked to speak last night, and so I pretty much, like, spent most of last night, like trying to meditate and mostly like being like okay what are you going to talk about and then being like no come back and what are you going to talk about and then no come back so it was like this whole situation where I was like you're not just go with it um and then I was at work today and all of the people I'm a hairstylist so everybody that was in my chair was in a a So I had the opportunity to talk about all my anxiety. So I basically, like, I have 40 minutes to, like, freak out and be uncomfortable, but I spent way more than 40 minutes today (laughs) freaking out about what I was going to say. Because, like, I want to say something that's, like, good and sober and, like, I'm doing the thing and look at me, I'm perfect at AA and, like... That's, that doesn't even matter. Like, I mean, at the at the end of the day, like, y'all are going to take whatever you take away from it. So it has nothing to do with me. Um, but so, so I, let's see. I have about four and a half years. Um, this time of year is very painful for me. Um... And it's like the sun comes out, and um, I'm like, ooh, tea drinking. Um, and not like 
day drink on day drinking on Saturday with your friends, like day drinking on Tuesday by yourself. Um, like that was that, and then like taking a nap and then going back out. Um, so like it's it brings up a lot for me, and like there's like nothing I can do about it because the sun is out and it's like it that's an instant reminder. Um, and so also like being that it's like six month that like six month period of like everything that led up to why I got sober. Um, it's just like it's a thing, right? And um I feel like it doesn't necessarily get easier, like the longer I've been sober. It more is like just like a reminder that um but, like, I had to go through a lot of shit to get to that point to come to the rooms. And um, and so it's I'm, – I'm feeling a lot of feelings. And especially because, you know, six months from now, God willing or whatever, it'll be five years, which is, like, a big fucking deal. Um, so that's where I'm at. We'll just start there. Um, I did grow up in an alcoholic household. I was not really completely aware that that was the case um, until later. Um, Like, my dad drank every day, but it was, like, never a thing. It was like he just always had a beer in his hand, and that was normal. Um, And my mom was, like, a drinker on the weekends kind of lady but like that meant that she got drunk to a point that she was like fuck you bitch like every weekend um so it was lovely um but like I didn't understand that that wasn't like okay until later um and I don't know that that's like why I'm an alcoholic but I know that like it was an example for me um and I I really, I think when I was, like, 11 years old, I started cutting myself, and that was, like, the first sign that I, like, needed to check out from reality. Um, And at 11, that's kind of intense. Um, And, like, I didn't see it on, like, TV or, like, there wasn't, like, it wasn't, like, oh, Marilyn Manson made me do it or, like, any of that kind of (laughs) shit. It was, like, it was just an instinct that I had. Um, And... For, I think, most of, like, my high school, like, you know, not, I mean, most alcoholics, I feel like, start drinking really young, and that was, like, not my experience. It was, like, I wanted to be in control as much as possible, and drinking made me feel out of control. And I think that at a certain point, I got tired of being in control, and... And I was thinking this week, actually, about this movie, Gia, and there's a scene where she says, um, do I make you nervous? And he says, yeah. And she says, good, because that's the idea. You scare the shit out of people, and then they don't see how scared you are. And I think that for a long time, like, that was, like, that was my attitude, um, And it was, like, I wanted to just, like, build up a wall to, like, keep people away. And drinking meant that that wall would come down, and I wasn't comfortable with that. Um, And then eventually, like, I kind of got tired of being, like, the uptight girl that nobody knew. Um, And, you know, like, I would drink by myself when no one was around, because then I was comfortable and safe in that, um, but, like, I still didn't, like, let people see me, um, until I feel like, I think I was, like, probably 23 when I, like, really started, like, actually drinking around people, um, and, like, I think that that comes from, like, as soon as I started drinking, it was a fucking problem. Like, I was passed out in my own puke on my friend's porch. Like, that was, like, how it was, and I didn't like that. Um, and then eventually, like, I just stopped caring. And, um, so, like, the, the I had arrived thing didn't happen until way later. Um, and, 
you know, it worked for a long time and I like made a lot of friends and I got to be like a lot of different people to a lot of different people. Um, and I was like really good at dressing up and playing the part. Um, and if that meant like, you know, drinking by myself during the day or like going out at night and dressing up and being the fancy lady that had a few cocktails, like I was good at like kind of compartmentalizing it. And I would never stay somewhere long enough that anyone really got to see what was going on. Um, so I had bars that I was, like, willing to do yoga on the floor at 4 a.m. And then I had, like, bars that, like, no one would ever see me that wasted. Um, and it was, like, depending on, like, whether or not I gave a shit about the people that were in the room. Um, the carry house was my drunk yoga bar. Um, and, like, pretty much I didn't give a shit about anyone that was in there. Um, and I think the Carrie House was, like, the beginning of my demise, really. Because um, <laughs> I would walk in and Byron would hand me the bottle, and that would be that. I didn't even have to ask for anything. Um, but, you know, I, I, like, really quickly, like, got into this place where, like, like, I was, like, sleeping in my car because I had too many, like, scary situations where I may get a DUI. And, like, I had decided that that was unacceptable to get a DUI. But, like, I would still drive drunk as long as I wasn't too drunk. Like, as long as, like, and that's where the drunk yoga came in. It was, like, my way of deciding whether or not I was really that drunk. And if I was doing drunk yoga, more than likely I was too drunk to drive. Um, I don't know. I had, I had logic. Um, but, like, during this time period, I also had, like, you know, I was, like, spending a lot of time, um, like, writing. And that was, like, either writing or reading at the bar. And that was acceptable because it was, like, romantic. And, you know, I looked like a smart girl, like, Sitting at the bar by herself writing. Um, it's very mysterious. And, um, but like usually I was like writing lists of like rules about my drinking. Like what was acceptable? Like I was like, okay, so like don't drink, you know, before seven. And if you do drink before seven, you have to quit drinking by like 10. Like I had like time periods that it was okay. Um, and then like, you know, like, try not to drink at work anymore. And, like, <laughs> and the carry house was across the street from my work, so that never worked out. Um, but, you know, so I had, like, all these, like, rules that I could never actually stick to. Um, and sort of, like, during all this time, like, there were, like, fun moments and, like, and that, and, you know, there was the I had arrived and, like, you know, I was, like, making friends and I was, like, Kind, kind of comfortable, um, sometimes. Um, and that was like new to me. Like it was new to like just like be out and be loud and like be comfortable and be accepted. Um, but at the end of the day, like I was still going home and like, you know, crying myself to sleep and shit. And I made lots of, like, fun decisions about, like, people that I was going to date that I had no business dating and who had no business dating me. Like, we had nothing in common. Uh, we had alcohol in common. Or if we didn't, then I was like, why are you, why are we doing this? Um, you know, and, and so, like, I think through a series of, of situations where, like, oh, that went bad huh, why? What's wrong with me? Like, I kept thinking, what's wrong with me? And so, I like, the same thing as, like, making a list of, like, all my acceptable times to drink. Like, I also would, like, make lists of, like, if you just lose weight, if you just, you know, like, clean your car out and stop drinking in your car, like, if you just, like, you know, stop going and getting burritos and having the I had the security guard. I was, like, friends with this dude at that point. He would get out, come over to me and, like, walk me to the taco truck because he knew that I wasn't going to make it. You know, it was, like, it was a whole thing. But, like, that never worked out. Like, I, ne like, I never came up with, like, the perfect 
way to like just be okay. And like my, my like, you know, the end of my drinking wasn't that exciting. Like I didn't end up in a hospital. I didn't end up in jail. I never got a DUI. Like none of that happened. Um, I just like, I had had like a two week period where, um, like, um, the boy who I was sleeping with that had a pregnant girlfriend, um, had finally dumped me and, um, the sober guy that I was seeing had finally dumped me and, um, you know, I like locked myself out of my car and like left it at some bar and like had to go back and get it during the middle of farmer's market. Um, and I was like late to my own birthday party because of that. Um, and then one of my friends, I found out she was not driving, but her husband was, um, and they were driving home from a burlesque show and, um, she died. Um, and I used to put on burlesque shows. And so like the following week we had this, like this, like memorial for her. Right. And I was like, I'm not going to get drunk at this one. Like, I can't do that at this one. That's too fucked up. And, um, and I made it through most of the night holding it together, like doing okay. And then I ended up at Merchants, and I don't know what happened. And I, like, came out to my car the next day, and I was, like, three feet from the curb. And somebody had, like, followed me home to make sure that I got home okay. And I was like, dude, I fucked that up. Like, the one thing that I was like, I can't drink at this thing. Like, I can't. Like, she died because of this. And, like, I can't do that. Like, I totally did. And that was, like... You know, it was, like, I kept seeing all these, like, bad things happening, and then, you know, my friend dying sort of was, like, okay, like, clearly I have problems, and maybe drinking might be one of them. And so I woke up the next day, and I was, like, okay, I'm going to, like, not drink for, like, a month and see what happens. And I posted on Facebook that I wasn't going to drink, and too many people liked it, and it pissed me off. <laughs> and, you know, it was like one of those, like, fuck you guys. Um, <laughs> but one of my friends reached out to me, and he was in the burlesque community, and so, like, he kind of, like, knew what I was going through um, with Sparkly. And, um, and I was unaware that he was sober. And apparently had been sober this whole time. And, um, and I like came to find out that a lot of my friends were sober. And I was like, wow, that's, I just thought like maybe you drank a, every once in a while. Um, and, and he took me out to coffee and we, um, talked about, you know, like, he gave me the like 20 questions or whatever. And I was like really upset with how many of them I said yes to. And then there, you know, it's like, I think you're only supposed to like say four, like four of them you're supposed to say yes to the rest of them, you know? And I was like, I think I was like 18 or something. Um, and I was like, Oh cool. So that's a thing. Um, and so like, I was like, okay, I'm 30 days. I'm just going to like not drink for 30 days and like see if my life gets better. And, um, and I lasted about two weeks um, before I was like, okay, my life is not getting better, and I am very lonely. Um, and because I was like, I was just sitting in my room, like, watching, like, old noir and, like, being really bummed out that I wasn't drinking whiskey. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Um and so I, I was actually working at Gaylords on Piedmont Avenue. So, like, most of y'all came in there. I knew you. You knew me. And so it was, like, really easy for me to come into AA because everybody was like, oh, hey, finally. <laughs> you know? And, and so it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal, but it wasn't, like, nearly as scary because I already had these friendly faces and, um, 
And I mostly sat in the back of the room and didn't want to talk to anyone and scowled a lot. And um, people said hi to me, and I was just like, no. <laughs> Thank you. And, like, <laughs> and was, like, pretty grumpy most of the time. And... Um, come to find out that's totally normal and it's also okay to be a bitch. Everyone will just say that's great. Keep coming back. <laughs> um, so if you're a bitch, it's cool. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I like found myself in some situations that were undesirable. Um, and I got 13 step and, um, and I was like within my first 30 days and I ended up pregnant and, um, and like, that's like the worst, one of the worst things that could happen to you in when you're 30 days sober. And, um, and I ended up like having to have an abortion and, and like during that time period, one of my friends that I had been like hanging out at her house all the time, she was like, girl, you you need to actually work the program. Like, you can go to meetings, that's fine, but, like, you need to actually work the program. And, like, especially right now, like, there's, there's like, no way that you're going to get through this if you don't actually, like, reach out. And so she basically, like, forced me to be her sponsee, and I was like, okay, fine. And, but the thing was that, like, I wasn't going to get sober if somebody didn't force me to, like, I wasn't gonna ask someone to be my sponsor. I wasn't gonna like be friendly with you guys. Like I was going to sit in the back of the room until I found a reason to leave. And, um, and so it was really great that she did that. And she like, really like was like, okay, we're going to get through this as fast as possible. Like that's it. And, um, there wasn't any like, Oh, but like, let's have, you know, like a six month conversation about what God means. Like, no, like, you're not God. You know that? Mm, yes, I know that. Okay, then let's move on. And like, and that was like pretty much it. And, um, and so like, I kind of like during that, through that, I was like, okay, if I can stay sober through this, then like, I guess I'm doing this thing. And, um, and so I did, and I was kind of like an A student about it, and um, I really wanted like all the gold stars because I like was so thorough in all my writing, um, and she did not give me gold stars, <laughs> and that's okay. I have since moved on. I'm okay with this. Um, <laughs> still want my gold stars, but um, but you know she was like really patient and really loving with me and um kind of exactly what i needed and and you know like the god stuff didn't matter she was like okay like think of things that are greater than you and i was like the pyramids <laughs> um the ocean like so many things are greater than me um and that was like enough you know and i and I remember like having really like big problems with their prayer stuff and um and I sat I had used to have this like succulent garden at my old house and so I like sat with the succulents and I was like okay so I have to do this third step prayer and y'all are going to help me okay <laughs> like I like did it I was like I can't just like say this out here, like, I had to, like, do it at something, so my succulents got to be God for a little while, um, and fortunately, like, she was, like, somebody that, like, you know, Walter Matthau, I think, was her first God, and I was, like, okay, so John Waters, like, we can do this, um, and, and that was, like, really good for me, because I was pretty aggressively atheist at that point, um, and I think i might still be a little bit and that's okay I'm like I've managed to work the program and stay sober and like it really doesn't matter what I believe in at the end of the day like I'm still here I still know I'm not God and I can't control shit you know so like it doesn't make a difference for me um but you know and I I did my my very thorough fourth step through Turns out most of it wasn't that important, and um, 
and and like most of what I took from that was like a lot of like was like six and seven was like my character defects and like how do I how do I like let go of those um and it's been, you know, four and a half years of a process of letting go of those because some of them I kind of dig my heels in. And I'm like, I still want to talk trash sometimes. Um, and, you know, like when I'm ready to let go of it, when it doesn't serve me anymore, I will. Um, but right now it provides some humor sometimes. Um, and that's okay. Um, and as far as like amends go, like I was, I was a little gung-ho about making amends, and maybe some of them I should have waited. Um, some of them I wasn't ready to make. And, and like, looking back, like, regret being so quick to go make it all okay, because I, I didn't feel like, I didn't agree with what I was even saying. Um, and then there are other people that, like, in the last year, I've made amends to them, and I'm really happy that I waited, and I can actually, like, honestly, like, feel like what I said was true. Um, um, I have not made amends to my family, um, and most of that is, like, I show up and, like, try to make loving amends to them, um, and I'm still not ready to actually sit down and um, forgive them, so I can't, like, honestly offer that to them. Um, and that'll come with time when I'm ready. But in the meantime, like, you know, my grandpa died, and I showed up for, like, two weeks straight, and, like, and that's, like, that's kind of how that goes. Like, I show up through shit, and, like, which I never would have before. Like, I would have been way too busy. My mom would be like, you're way too busy. Um, and I, you know, that whole process. Um, but I'm okay with where we are right now. And I think at some point either it'll, like, be, it'll, like, become a thing that I probably don't actually need to have that conversation with, with them because we've, like, we've kind of sifted through it over time or it'll become a thing that I like seriously need to sit down and be like, so about that. Um, and I will know when that happens. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as like, as like 10, 11 and 12 go, like I, I, I was really gung ho about sponsoring women and, had too many at one point and it wasn't helpful um because it was too much um and I was a little too like invested in it to the point that I was like thinking about them all the time and like that's great but it was like more of like a weird control thing than it was like actually like thinking about them in regards to like being helpful and and so I lost, um, when, when they, like, when they all moved on to whatever they moved on to, um, I did not actively seek out new sponsees, and I haven't. Um, and part of that is, like, having a life where, like, I get to be helpful in other ways, and I don't feel like, um... Like, I feel useful and helpful in, like, a lot of other aspects of my life. And as much as, like, I would like to have a sponsee now, because I feel less, less like it would be, like, a weird codependent thing and more, like, I can, I can be of service. Um, but <clears throat> it'll happen when it happens. And I'm okay with that. I think, like, I think most of her in the last few years, like, most of the work I've done has been, like, this is really uncomfortable, and I'm going to sit in this and, like, let it be uncomfortable. And, and like, really just, like, marinate in it um, until it's not. And, um, and that's been 
what's given me the most amount of peace is like being able to be like, yeah, this sucks. And that's the way it is. Um, but like, I think, you know, like I quit my job in sobriety and like, um, my like 10 year barista career. Um, I finally was like, I don't need to do this anymore and went back to school and, um, got my license and started doing hair and sat through like a really shitty, um, assistant situation for a long time. And, um, it was cool until it wasn't. And then finally I was like, okay, I don't have to do this anymore. And I moved on and, um, made the decision to like go out on my own, which was a really big deal and really scary. And it like has served me greatly because the amount of peace I have as a result of not having to take shit from people is, um, it's worth every penny that I'm not making. Um, (laughs) it turns out I don't do well being talked down to like I just it just doesn't it doesn't happen for me um and like and it was like such a freeing thing to be like oh I don't have to do this anymore like I became a hairdresser so I can do whatever the fuck I want to like that was the reason um and and I think like being in sobriety like that's like the only thing that like is like I get to like like, find this challenge and be like, hmm, I don't like this. <laughs> and I sit there for a while in it. And I, like, wait till it's, like, really uncomfortable. And then I'm like, okay, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, but, like, I wouldn't have done that when I was drinking. Like, when I was drinking, I would have been like, oh, this is uncomfortable, and I'm going to go home, and I'm never going to deal with anything ever again. You know, it was like, I couldn't get in my car to, like, go meet somebody because the anxiety was too much. I, like, couldn't go – I couldn't make a doctor's appointment when I almost broke my elbow because somebody threw me. Like, like that was too much for me, and now I'm dealing with that. You know, it's been, like, eight years, and my elbow is still fucked up. Um, But, like, these are, like, things that, like, I wasn't even capable of grasping. Like, when people were telling me, go to the emergency room, I was like, no, I, I think, I think it's gonna be okay. I think it's gonna be fine. And like now, I like really wish that I would have gone to the emergency room, you know? But like, I couldn't even make a rational decision until I came to the rooms and like started asking other people what they thought and listening to them. And actually like being like, oh, that's kind of a valid point. Maybe I will go to the hospital. Um, which also happened in sobriety. Um, but, you know, so it's, I think, like, the most, the most important thing for me has just been, like, being able to breathe. And, like, it's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, like, being able to like, pause when I'm uncomfortable and, like, pause before I say some shit that I don't need to say. Um, You know, like, I was at a dinner the other night and um, I was, like, hanging out with these normies and they were talking about all this conflict that they have with their friends and, like, how they, like, trying to figure out how to handle it. And I was like, I don't have, I don't have any conflict. Like, I was, like, bummed out because I didn't have anything to contribute to the conversation. But, like, I, like, realized that, like, I don't have those types of friends in my life anymore because I separated from all of them. Um, And, like, the only conflict that I've had in, like, the last few months has been with someone that I don't miss. Like, like she, she, like, removed herself from my life, and I was like, sweet. I don't have to deal with that. Thank you. You know? And, and like, it's such a, it's such a trip to not have drama. Like, I used to, when Joel and I were first dating, we, I, we used to, like, walk into a bar and I would be like, oh, shit, oh, 
shit, oh shit. And like, I would be like, so that person, da 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 da. And I would like tell them like all this, like all the scoop of everybody that was in the bar because I knew it. And it was mostly involving me. You know, like the, like I was the common denominator in all the drama. And, and I just thought it was like life. Like, I just thought that that's how people behaved and, like, that that was okay. And to, like, get to be shown a different way of living and, like, not behave like that anymore and, like, not walk into, like, I mean, there may be, like, three people that I would be like, "Uh uh-oh, that's uncomfortable, you know, but, like, I still wouldn't walk away from them. I would be like, hey, how's it going? Which is huge. Because I used to, like, put on bitch face and, like, be ready to roll, you know? Um, And, like, I don't trip at night. Like, I don't lay my head down and think about all the damage I did today. Like, I lay my head down and think about, like, well, I really should have done that color better. Or, like, you know, it's, like, I spend most of my time, like, berating myself for not being perfect. Um, which sucks, but, like, it's still better than spending all my time thinking about how you guys aren't perfect. Um, and, and like, how it would just be perfect if y'all were better. Um which, like, sometimes uh, I'm a little self-righteous, but it's another thing I'm working on. Um, and I'm okay with always having work to do. Like, I will always have work to do. And, um, you know, like, I quit smoking a month ago, and it's been a trip because this is the second time in the last, like, couple years that I've quit smoking, and... Um, And I, like, got to this place where I was just, like, oh, it's, like, totally okay to not want to die. Like, it's okay to, like, want to be healthy and do good things and, like, feel good in my body. And, um, and that's not something that I wanted for a long time. Like, I really romanticized being fucked up and hurting myself and hurting other people and thinking that that was cute. Um... And it's been a, like a slow process of being like, yeah, I kind of want to live. And like, if I want to live, then I kind of want to live a good life. And so that means coming back here and doing the thing. And I'm done. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.